Good evening, everybody. You are listening to a Rattledge and Broadcasting premiere podcast, TV Party Tonight. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And tonight, our favorite show is Demon Slayer, Kimetsu no Yaiba, I assume is how you pronounce that. Kimetsu no Yaiba. Close. <sighs> Thank you, David. <laughs> um, so um, I want to introduce the panel tonight. Uh, this was actually pitched by the newest member of our panel. This will be her first full podcast. She came on briefly with her brother to do Toy Story 4 uh, two years ago, and she occasionally does a watch-along with me. We've done one for Flash Gordon and Godzilla. Uh, but this is the first time she's pitched a show for TV Party Tonight and then decided to be on the podcast available to talk about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Lily Radelidge. How do you do, madam? I'm glad to be here. It's been so long since I did one. Yes, indeed. This is the first one where you're actually, I mean, the Toy Story one, I kind of said, come on, tell us what you thought of the movie, then go to bed. So this is the first time you're actually like part of a full panel discussion with three old middle-aged men. I, it's definitely going to be a little hard because I'm used to having Jonas in the background screaming. Yeah. We tied up her little brother and threw him in the, in the, uh, in the bathroom, uh, ba- <laughs> bathtub. So if you hear, if you hear murmuring and screaming in the background, that, that no, um, <laughs> Could we have just one podcast that can't potentially be used as evidence? <laughs> Reach Boy, that, is, that would be nice. <laughs> His mom took him, so it's so it's just her. Um, those other dulcet tones you hear are the voices of David Wright. How you doing, David? I'm good, thanks. And uh, the coverage god of 411 Mania and anime enthusiast, Robert Winfrey. How do you do, sir? Well, uh, considering the last podcast I did, I expounded on the virtues of arson. <laughs> and now what you're... did I just say? And now you look. I also talked about Nicolas Cage curb stomping an animatronic gorilla into a urinal. Arson was the least interesting thing we discussed. <laughs> My point still stands. <laughs> Wouldn't be a rattleage in broadcasting network podcasts unless we discussed the possibility of at least one felony being committed. Speaking of felonies being committed, Lily. Um, <laughs> There's so many ways that transition is wrong. <laughs> so I've been your father for roughly 10 years. Yes. And um, I was thinking about, I, I had this thought that, you know, you turn 10 and suddenly everything went from Barbie princesses, but Barbies, uh, Disney princesses and, um, and bunked to anime and manga and cherry blossoms and ramen and Godzilla. And I was like, what the hell happened here? <laughs> you turned into, a, I felt like you turned into a different person overnight. Um, and you, and every word out of your mouth was demon slayer. Um, but as I, as I think back to when you were younger, you actually have been watching anime for a really long time. Wait, I remember, really? I re- yeah, I remember you watching Glitter Force. Uh, uh, when I you still were watch that show. I still watch that show. Yeah, you watch Glitter Force. You watch Glitter Force Doki Doki, and you've watched the Shira, which is anime inspired, um, the Shira show on I think it's Netflix. Pokemon. Pokemon. You've also okay. I was going to ask you. So, what other before the sort of eruption of uh, manga and anime that you've recently been watching came about? Like, what other shows kind of led you down this path? What, what did you used to watch? There are a lot of cartoons I used to watch, and now realizing cartoons and anime are very similar. So which ones were they? Well, one of the cartoons I, I watch a lot are... Um, Big City Greens is one of those cartoons I watch. It just mm-hmm. looks kind of like anime. Okay. Um, Let me ask you a different question. <laughs> how, did you find, how did you end up coming to Demon Slayer? Who told you well, about it? How did you learn about it? Well... 
there's a YouTuber I watched who went from loving like a lot of rainbowy stuff to now loving anime. And okay. I got and then I came and then I met a lot of friends who knew about anime and I'm like, okay, my life has became filled with it. I might as well check it out. And the first anime I started to watch was Demon Slayer and I thought, wow, this is actually really cool. I think I'm into it now. Okay. So you learn so partially from you some YouTuber that you watch and partially from the kids at school talking about it. Yeah. Would you say Demon Slayer is like the most popular anime amongst your cohort amongst the kids at school? I'm the only one who really thinks of that as the best anime ever. Other there's this one kid who thinks it's just so cheesy. Okay, what's what's everyone's favorite anime at school? So well there's not many kids, but one kid is really obsessed with this anime called Naruto. Naruto? Unfriend that person. Immediately. <laughs> Honestly, I ha start watching it myself, and I kind of lose a little bit of it, the interest of it. But I still, I prefer to read the animes over the, the manga. The, yeah, the manga over watching it, but I still like watching it. Okay, because um, Naruto is eighty percent filler. You're better off with just the straight story. <laughs> um, real quick before we move on, what other animes are you currently watching that you like? I know one of them was My Hero Academia. What else? Hunter x Hunter, Assassination Classroom. Assassination Classroom, right? Uh, that was the manga you bought yesterday. Yes. What anim What other animes are you watching? I'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> so part of being on a podcast is being able to answer questions. <laughs> well, I tried to think back to things I... You're going to need to make um, notes next time. Robert Winfrey. Again, okay, no. my first time after a long time being on a podcast. Okay. Um, all right, so you asked to be on this when I told you I was doing this with my daughter, and um, I know you've been watching anime for a long time. How did you come to Demon Slayer? Uh, I hadn't, I'd watched a little bit of it before you kind of said, hey, we're going to be talking about this, and I said, well, if you want someone else to help carry the conversation, I'm certainly willing. I have no life outside of, no, not outside of anything, I just have no life. Um, Demon Slayer blew up a little bit after it debuted in terms of anime form. I think in no small part thanks to YouTuber PewDiePie, who very famously you know, tweeted something complimentary about it, and then it uh, and it just kind of uh, it went viral on Twitter uh, very briefly. But enough people stuck around. Uh, it helps that you know 2020 was a giant wasteland of entertainment. So anything that actually did come out uh, got a lot more play than it would usually. And Demon Slayer is, in several respects, very paint by numbers, but I don't necessarily consider that a negative. Yeah, in, there, in our, in our uh, chat, I refer to it as jo uh, Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, the anime series. Uh, it's a little bit like that. It's, uh, I think the... There's a couple of interesting things it does to kind of twist on the on the typical shonen tropes, but uh, yeah, again, you had a few very high profile people expressing their support for it. It's a very very well made show. I mean, whatever you think about the writing, the quality of animation that went into this thing is stunning. It is a beautifully animated show. Did you read the manga? No, uh, I know how it ends, but I haven't read it yet. David, what about you? Um, you also enthusiastically wanted to join the podcast. Um, I know that anytime we talk animation, it's it's you know you and Alexis is always a fair chance one of you is going to jump on. Um, and we know we, we know that you for a time uh, lived in Japan and all of that. How did you come to Demon Slayer? Lucky, my wife. That basically, my okay. wife was into it, okay. so we ended up watching most of it together. So when you said you were going to do Demon Slayer on the podcast, I thought, oh, I've seen most of that. May as well hop in. What were we going to say, Robert? It's the, way, the pause after you said my wife. I wanted to go, okay, Borat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought maybe he'd been watching Too Young to Die Old and was like, oh, God, is everyone going to talk like Miles T uh, Teller now? Um, I, I will just leave say. if we start taking pregnant four to five second pauses between <laughs> answering each other's questions. Uh, Dave, last question. Did you read the manga at all? No. All right. Lily read the first one. We we went to Barnes & Noble yesterday. I was looking for the second one. It was not there. 
Yeah, and they only had the third one and the rest of them. I like, saw no second. That one. keeps happening every time we go to the bookstore. You always look for the second one and can't find it. I, th I think that you couldn't find the first or the second one the very first time we went, and then this time yeah. the second one was gone. Um, it's like really weird for me because I, because with my hair academia, I was able to find three of them, and yet I couldn't find the second one for Demon Slayer. Well, I wanted to ask you, before we get into the actual show, um, how closely adapted is the show from the little bit that you've read to the manga itself? Because it felt, it reads to me when I watched the show, like they just did a direct, like they literally tore the pages out and storyboarded them. But um, you actually read it, so you tell me. How close, how close is the show to the book? Uh, some of the illustrations are definitely different from the anime, but... It still is very, very similar. If I, if I, if I watch the anime along with reading the book, I can I can see and hear a lot of the similar things. Okay. It's just the illustrations that sometimes are different. So this thing is twenty six episodes. Uh, we watched it on Netflix. So we watched it with the English dub, and it adapts the first seven chapters of the manga. The next bit of the manga is captured in the forthcoming film, Moving Train. And then I guess there's going to be a second season to close up this journey. So let's get into it. Um, the first couple of episodes, much like any series, sort of establish who your characters are, what the main thrust of the story is. And, um, you know, I, I joked about this being sort of, you know, the hero's journey. So we start off with... Um, how do you pronounce his name? Taranju? Tanjiro. Tanjiro. Um, that's going to be a long show, Mark. <laughs> how, is it I, how is it that me and David can pronounce it, yet you can't? What's the villain's name? Mitsubishi? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's Muzan Kibutsuji. I had to yell at both him and my brother the whole time we were... Right, I, the villain's name is Mr. Oogity Boogity. I got it. Oh my it. gosh. <laughs> now stop correcting me. <laughs> stop being uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so Tanjiro um, goes into town to sell coal and he comes back and his family's been slaughtered by a demon um, he finds his sister unconscious uh, and he carries her to find, to find a doctor to find medicine and along the way uh, she wakes up and reveals that she has been turned into a demon uh, they end up being given help by one of the uh, by one of the townsmen who starts to train Tanjiro to be a demon slayer, explaining to him that that's what you need to do here. I think um, in between in between that, they actually ran afoul of a demon slayer at first. Um, and then, so the first couple of episodes here are Tanjiro training to be a demon slayer. Uh, let me go to you first, Robert. What did you think of the first couple of episodes here as we get from the origin to the end of his training um again this is all very standard stuff you know there's a something of an inciting incident our plucky spiky haired protagonist goes off on his journey begins training passes a test becomes a member of the corps blah 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 again this is very very standard uh so there's not a whole lot uh, you know, narratively that we can really cut to sink your teeth into too much just yet what stood out to me, especially if we look at the first episode or so, is uh, the quality of the animation. Uh, the brief little encounter between Tanjiro and Tomio, I seem to recall. Forgive me if I'm misremembering that guy's name. Uh, they do some really interesting stuff with the camera work. This, this show blends together... The blending of three-dimensional imaging with two-dimensional imaging is a rough thing. Sometimes it is so unbelievably jarring that it just completely removes you from the show. Sometimes it's just comically bad. Yeah, let me let me talk about if you're talking about when they change animation styles to where it's the you know the beautiful standard crisp anime to when it becomes more simpler and they have dots for eyes and it looks no, like No, 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 no. That's that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. What do you Okay. That, that's a very deliberate stylistic choice that is used to kind of convey whether a scene is meant to be more humorous or meant to be more serious. I, I realize that's like a standard thing in anime, and I don't know if um, David wants to kind of jump in and give any uh, explanation of it, but I fucking hate it. 
I really do. I don't like it either. It doesn't even look like an anime. It just looks like a cartoon. I when they shift styles like that so suddenly, and they they don't do it nearly as much in the beginning. And I was actually I enjoyed the first half of this a lot with with almost no complaints. Um, when it gets to the second half, especially when you meet Zenzitsu. Zenitsu. Zenitsu. He's my least favorite character of oh, all time. Between, <laughs> be, between the standard one character that has to scream and cry <laughs> all of his dialogue and the constant switching of, uh, of animation styles, I was like, I don't know what's worse right now. Too old to die young or this. But go on. How dare you, sir. <laughs> that, is, that is a deep, profound exaggeration on your part. <laughs> Yeah, I assume Mark, you're talking about the chibi scenes, yeah, where they all kind of go a little small and mushy. They all, everyone looks like a Funko Pop. That's the one, yes. Yeah, I mean, I still don't understand why Funko Pop's a thing, but that's another conversation. But yeah, it's just kind of supposed to be cute and funny because Japan loves cute things a lot. Why? And yeah, it's just a stylistic thing, usually to denote, yeah, more more of a comedic tone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think what Robert's getting at is the actual like compositing between the 2d animation and the 3d animation and how well they merge together okay. which has historically been a very difficult thing in anime mostly because they don't seem no one has figured out hey maybe the frame rate of the cgi should match the frame rate of the 2d animation boy have there been s- many uh many soldiers fallen on the battlefield of trying to figure that out yeah that's that's just one of those strange why hasn't anyone figured this out yet but yeah the the history of 2d 3d integration in anime is uh is a long and and bloody one but, and but thankfully this year they seem to finally so yeah, did we lose you no no i'm i'm still here go ahead right. uh, yeah so that was the... sort of the issues there anyway yeah, yeah. mark uh, or sorry robert uh, this one does a great job of kind of blending the two of them together and it's great because you can do things with cameras in 3D, you know, in a rendered three-dimensional space that you can't do with two-dimensional space. You have to physically draw everything. So if you want to take a big swooping camera shot designed to represent you know, how a character moves through three-dimensional space, you wind up chopping it up and doing a little bit here and a little bit there. And you have you know, other little tricks of sound and uh, you know, line composition to indicate movement, but you can't swoop the camera through the physical space. When you have three, when you have something rendered three dimensionally, you can, and they do that here on occasion with a great effect. So I, I just wanted to give them credit for that because finally, something seems to have gotten. I mean, this isn't the this isn't the only one to do it, but it's one of the more high profile ones. I think the sequence is it's actually one of the beautiful things about Attack on Titan. I seem to recall most, not all, but most of their big and big action sequences are done by hand rather than using uh, elements of the 3d rendering with a handful of exceptions of course and if you happen to watch that show you'll know what i'm talking about because nobody's drawn the colossal titan moving around that much it's very obviously rendered hmm. but uh, it's not a again not to the detriment of that show uh it's just you know it's largely artistic choices and try and if you can make it work properly um uh, you know, there's there's other shows that even ones that are fully three dimensionally rendered that can't quite seem to figure out how to make this work to their advantage. Much as it pains me to admit I've watched it, I'm looking at you, Berserk. <laughs> um, so as we were saying, you know, the first five episodes is establishing this world, establishing our our main characters getting him into the training, him struggling through the training, completing the training. Again, I got a very, I got a very, uh, what George Lucas ripped off from Kurosawa feel from these first couple of episodes. And then finally, um, final selection. And then he, he gets a sword and that takes us all the way through episodes one through five. David, your thoughts. Uh, this is probably the part of the show that I've seen the least. I think I came in sort of after this, but like I've seen enough training montages to to get the general gist of it. I'm I'm pretty much on the same page as Robert. Just yeah, like it's it's fine, looks pretty, but it's again mostly stuff we've seen before in other shows. It you get your inciting incident, and then the you know the rules of the world are explained at least enough for the audience to to have a some idea of what's going on before our heroes set off into the into the world on his journey. So Lily, um, you said that you gave this a shot based on this and that. 
And how far into it did you get before you were like, I love this, I'm hooked? Like, how many episodes in? I think when I start, when I saw the first, when I finished the first episode, I thought, huh, this is really interesting. I think I might start watching it even more. And eventually I finished the whole series. Okay, so you were hooked from episode one. Yes. And a lot of the episodes got me to think a lot. Okay. Just focusing on the first five episodes. Just focusing on the first five episodes. Just focusing on the first five episodes. I want to make sure you heard me. I heard you. So episode six. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What was your favorite part about... um, What did you like about the first five episodes? What were your favorite parts? Was there anything you didn't like? First five... I say the first five episodes were definitely really good. It was just some of the characters I found. One thing that annoyed me during it is when, when during the final selection episode. Okay. The character there was a character that said he wanted his sword already and didn't care about anything else and just wanted his sword. The fact that we didn't see him until the final episode, or like we don't. The thing that annoys me a lot is when you don't see characters for such a long time and they appear once and then you never see them again. Yeah, I actually, when they ran into Man Bear Pig later on. Inosuke! (laughs) Hey, Inosuke is the best character in this entire stupid show. Watch yourself, Mark. (laughs) Yeah, I'd say he's a good character. Yes, when they ran into Man Bear Pig later on, I actually (laughs) thought that was the Mohawk kid. Really? Yeah, I thought that's who that was going to end up being. No, uh, Mohawk, Mohawk Kid is the younger brother of other psycho Hashi dude, and he gets his power from actually eating demon flesh. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let me just... Be forewarned. You talk with me, you're going to get spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Five bucks says there's a scene where he licks his sword. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I am... Um, while, was... while desperately shrieking, I'm not a ripoff of Stain. So I could... It's not um, a ripoff I... of... Five characters. Who <laughs> again and any number of people that Stain drew influence from, sure. So real quick, um, I like, you know, again, Lily was like, You gotta watch this with me. I think you'll love it. And I, at least as far as these first five episodes go, she wasn't wrong. Uh, I liked that we we get a running start right from the get-go and then we go back, and then that's kind of the only time they they, they mess with time in the show. It's not all over the place, it's pretty linear. Um it's amazing how much time passes. I think it's a couple of years. Yeah. Before it finally yeah, gets the, out. Train, the train montage is two years. Yeah. Um, which uh, doesn't feel it. I had to go back and read that. Uh, I think he actually, he might've said it as part of his dialogue, but um, I thought it all flowed very well. I actually, you know, I, I said before, when we watched devil man, cry baby, Robert, you know, I, I, I struggle with characters who are like, for the anime style, overly emotional, which I guess is a is a character trope that is very popular. I struggle with yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> that is. I and <laughs> it. <laughs> I dealt with it with Devil Man Crybaby because I knew that was the tenor of the show. But um, I was like, I God, if the if the main character just cries incessantly through this, I'm not going to make it through this show. And I and I was pleasantly surprised that. After the initial, oh my god, my life's been turned upside down, Tanjiro is actually a, a great point of view hero character to follow. He's, you know, he has his struggles, he has his imperfections, which any good hero should, but he's, he has no real annoying qualities, you know? He isn't screaming constantly, he's not, he's not Man Bear Pig, who's always wanting to fight with people. Inosuke! Sure. Um... <laughs> He's, I'm sorry if I'm going to yell at my dad all day during this podcast. Why? Winfrey does. Why would he? I'm sure he's like, oh, good. Someone else. <laughs> yeah, you, you've just stumbled upon the core of what this podcast is. <laughs> um, you know, it, like there, there's other characters in the show that have varying annoying qualities, one dimensional qualities to one degree or another. I, I think the, I think the hero, Tondro is actually, the most centered of the group. Just a quick roundtable reaction to that, and then we can move forward, Robert. Uh, well, this is one of the things that I think the show, not just the show, but the entire property, uh, it takes kind of the three sort of central tenets of a shonen protagonist, and rather than put them all... Normally you get all of these in some kind of alchemical balance in one character. 
Here it takes kind of the three central tenants and splits them into three different characters. Because you have uh, you have Tanjiro, who is the good boy who does good things because they're good and inspires people around him. You have Inosuke, who just is a, who is obsessed with self-improvement and lives to fight. And you have Lightning Boy. <laughs> <laughs> that is too. Uh, I'm just going to call him Crybaby. Um, <laughs> and he's a little bit, again, he's a little bit more the... Uh, I hate to say he's the tragic backstory because they've all got them, but he's the um, kind of the uncon- you know, the unconscious savant. I mean, literally the unconscious savant, now that I think about it. And normally, when you get another shonen uh, protagonist, you get all three of these together in some capacity. They're inspiring. They are natural. When I say naturally good, that doesn't mean they don't have to work or struggle, but they are naturally gifted at whatever pursuit they're going to engage in. And they love to improve through competition. Whatever their act, whatever their chosen activity, be that a again a fighting sport, uh, a non-battle battle, you know, cooking, uh, in some cases, you know, whatever your chosen medium happens to be, they are obsessed with it. And again, these are the three kind of tenets of a central shonen protagonist. Pick whichever one you want. I guarantee you find all three of them in some kind of balance in that character. So here they just separated them. And went, well, okay, what if instead of one protagonist with all three of these traits, we made three sort of protagonists that each are just like the embodiment of one of them? And again, to their credit, that's a somewhat more novel concept and way to approach it. And it does let, the, it also lets them kind of explore slightly different character aspect with all of them. I mean, again, if you take all three of those points, you've essentially got a fleshed out character. Uh, and so there's not, eh, I would say this. But the thing I would tell you is that they did a good job of at least fleshing out Tanjiro without giving him those other two characteristics. Like I, fe- I, I do feel like he's a fully fleshed out character that's going on a hero's journey. And I mean, over the course of the 26 episodes, there was definitely an arc um, to one degree or another. Um, Without having to do those other, you know, th- those other two personality well, well, traits that you were talking about. Well, well, that's kind of the benefit that this show is uh, that you know, that this show gets out of that. If you take all three of those and mash them into one character, there's a real finite amount of room for other uh, yep. for other things about your character to come out and breathe. Yep. So you get Naruto, who is just Naruto, and he's kind of just Naruto the whole freaking time. It's one of the gripes about him. Uh, Again, uh, this can apply to any of them. I mean, much as I love the big dumb idiot, uh, the small dumb idiot in this case, Hinata, he's kind of the same way. By David, separating but- them, they force themselves to develop other characteristics for these characters. So Tanjiro is very into his family. He's also very, you know, he goes out of his way to be empathetic towards those he has to fight, even though he knows they have to be stopped, which is a he also- really nice trick of writing. The, the other aspect of the show that I really like, and it comes through him, is that he is singularly on one mission. His mission is to restore his, his sister to her humanity, whether by, you know, in, in sort of the vampire lore fashion, killing the main demon that turned her that way, or collecting various demon blood in order to create an antidote. I think he seems to be going down two, two parallel streets to get to the same goal. But either way, the goal of Save My Sister was very clear and I, I you know, my, the oh, David, I don't, you can respond to this um, as well as our thoughts here on Tanjiro and then we really got to move on. Um, the, my, my, my fear with a lot of anime, um, really with a lot of fiction, but anime in particular, is not getting a clear sense of what the mission is. And this one does a great job of saying, no, no, no. The, yes, we, we did all of this preamble to get to a, a certain point, but it is all in the service of save my sister. And everything goes in that direction. And it's one of the best aspects of this show. Yeah, I find Tanjiro to be by by far the most likable of the characters. He's sort of an everyman almost. Like You can see him as just being a regular person who's been thrust into the situation. And he's just doing the best he can. Of course, he takes it very seriously. Because, yeah, the stakes are like his sister's life. And 
and by some empathy, just the effects of demons on the world itself. But he's he's not like foaming at the mouth. I must destroy all demons, like the you know Aaron Yeager, the villain of Attack on Titan. Oh, uh, for the love of Aaron is <laughs> yeah. Aaron is not the villain. That, and just not to not to derail the conversation, but I actually the longer that series has gone on, the more I appreciate that bit of Aaron's character at the beginning because it actually does let him grow over the course of the show. He starts out very monomaniacal, and we've now reached the point where he's. Uh, I think the anime is now. I'm, I'm not watching it live. I'm going to wait for it all to be done. But we've reached the point where he's the world's enemy now, right? Like that is yeah, his rightfully so. Name. Well, sure, he just started a war, but, you know. Okay, so what, what was your further point, Dave? <laughs> yeah. You, you tweaked Robert's nipples and he got all offended? <laughs> but, yeah, he's, like, a, a lot of the shonen typical protagonists, yeah, they'll just stand up and declare, I'm going to be the best insert career, profession, hobby, uh, ever. Be, you know. the I'm going to be the best ninja. I'm going to be I the will... greatest cook. I'm going to be the greatest baker. I'm going to be king of the pirates. I'm going to eat all the food. I will be the Hokage. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Whatever it happens to be. Yeah. All right. So and sometimes that might or might not involve a tragic backstory, but he's just like, you know, I need th this is the path I must walk. I need to fix my sister. That involves becoming a demon slayer, which means I need to be good at being a demon slayer. And I need to find Muzan, kill him, bring balance to the force. Yeah, <laughs> I, he's not he's not perfect by any means, but you know, he does stumble, he does fall. He does pick himself up, but you know it all seems very relatable and very realistic as to what a person in this situation would be, you know. And he doesn't need to put a pig's head on his to cover his face to do it. Uh, all right, so six, seven, and eight, um, we get an, the next arc, and this is sort of chapter one on his road to being a demon slayer. This is his first opportunity. The, the crow, like actually, the crow is probably one of my favorite characters in the show. Me, right, go this way. Me too. I love how. I love how he's always like, get to Southeast, get to Southeast. And he's always like, and when he did the uh, Tashio era secret part with the crow in it, it was funny when he said, you better not miss their all come to your house and, and like peck you. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed the crow too. Um, so the crow says, all right, your first mission, should you choose to accept it, this message will self-destruct, uh, is over here. And so they go over there. Um, that's episode six. I want to see a crow explode now. Thanks for that. <laughs> I, have a, I have a whole YouTube channel for you, buddy. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, so uh, he puts Nezuko in a box. He gets a very special wooden box to put her in, which I also thought was... I, I understood the plot reason for it. I understood the inherent story reason for it. But I kept laughing about Nezuko in a box. Because I yes, she, she's good at fighting, and she conveniently fits into most overhead storage bins. <laughs> all I'm all I'm curious about is how has she not suffocated yet? Oh, the wood breathes. Because of how small that box is. Oh, uh, what what's porous? Yeah, what the wood breathes. I was just yeah, playing with demon. Yeah, yeah but, there's also a very open question about whether or not she even needs to breathe. <laughs> right. Yeah, but it's still so small. If I was in there, I would. So she, sh she shrinks. They, they, that's one of her powers. They established that. She actually does mature or uh, devolve physically, depending on whatever she wants to do. She shrinks down to the size of a small child at one point. Yeah, but she still looks like she's the same size as the box, so I'm still curious how she has not suffocated yet. We've already been over this now. I know, but still. <laughs> if you want wood to be airtight, you have to seal it properly. Otherwise, yeah, you'll, al you'll always be fine. All right, so we have girls being abducted from their beds, and Tanjiro's on the case. Uh, that leads into episode seven, where they fight uh, the demon in the swamp. And this is where we run across, he finally figures out, you know, seven episodes into this, we figure out who, who was the demon that slaughtered his family, and it was uh, Mozambique. Wait, what? <laughs> what's, what's the demon's name? Mozambique. Right, that one. The main... So I thought it was interesting that they found him so early on in the show, and then I realized why, you know, the, he, he shows up, realizes Tanjiro has found him, creates another demon, and runs off for, like, the next 20 episodes. Um, <laughs> he's, he's gone. Uh, so they deal with that, and then the, ne the episode number eight, 
and we'll stop and talk about these three episodes for just a second. Um, I liked uh, the demons they deal with here. This is the one where the one demon um, is able to do telepathy with arrows and stuff. Uh, that's um, telekinesis with arrows. Maybe and then tomorrow. there's Tamari who throws beach balls. And so they work, uh, they work in concert. She throws, with tam- she throws Tamari balls. She th- I yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> she, she, she those, are not, those are not beach balls, man. Those are like solid wood. Uh, oh, yeah. Are they? Okay. Yeah, they hurt Nesuko's leg. Um, all right, so she throws bocce balls, and uh, her, she got the other demon. <laughs> she got the other demon there, who controls them with the arrows. And then um, this goes on for a while. This is almost the the entire length of episode number eight, dealing with this. Uh, one of the things I liked about the way that they struck. Oh, that's cute, Mark. You think a fight going on for one episode is long? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let me tell you about a show called Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> I, dude, I still have 20 episodes. 20 episodes. Well, even this one, get you know, we have we have fights going for more than one episode later on as the show unravel. So, like I I even within the confines of Demon Slayer, I am an, I I am properly learned that an anime fight may take a couple of episodes to unfold. There's a battle that almost made me cry, and it took forever to finish. In, in this show? Yes. Yes, we'll get to that. Yeah. So anyway, the um, point of discussion, I like uh, that we get to see Chandro, or, you know, like, okay, I'm, I'm a proper demon slayer now, I have a mission, and even here... He's struggling, um, especially with the Tamari balls and whatnot. He brute force and technique isn't going to win the day. He has to figure out how they're doing what they're doing and solve the puzzle. And once the puzzle is solved, he can then defeat the enemy. Uh, I thought that was in, in, in terms of story structure. I thought that was a good way of handling this. We'll go around the horn again. Robert, your thoughts, six, seven and eight. All right. Here we get uh, in particular the last couple, the last episode that we mentioned eight. We get another brilliant use of, again, a three-dimensionally rendered space and then uh, marrying that with our two-dimensionally, you know, hand-drawn characters. Right. Um, also nine. I forgot nine is the conclusion of all this. Either way. Yeah. Uh, the point stands. If you, only have, if you only have two dimensions to kind of replicate uh, uh, eyeball, eyeball palm boy arrows. Uh, I forget his name. Uh, Yahaba. <laughs> Sure. He dies quick. Yeah. He doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, if you only have two, di- if you only have, you know, a blank sheet of paper to draw that on, a talented artist can give you the feeling of, you know, moving around through three dimensional space. But for, again, for something that's meant to be mobile, which is you know, the entire point of animation, it's, it gets a little bit difficult. So the fact that they're able to do stuff not just with the art but with the camera to give you that sense of motion, that sense of depth, uh, again, it's just really, really well utilized here. <coughs> uh, the other thing that uh, we've, I think, probably deserves to be touched on, and we can do so here. I like that the demons. How do I say this? They need to be stopped, and there's never any. There's never a question about that. But in their final moments, we do get a reminder that these used to be humans. So while they and while this never leads anyone to go, at least yet, I can't possibly kill them. They used to be human. No, these are monsters. But they didn't start out that way. And it's an important thing to kind of keep the series grounded emotionally rather than having the uh, every demon just turn into, you know, another faceless stormtrooper. Yeah, I also like the fact that the demons... Um, it, it, Demon Slayer, um, despite its name, feels more like a traditional American co- um, superhero comic book story than what I what you what I thought you might get with a show called Demon Slayer. And so they they call them demons. They kind of operate like vampires, and they have superpowers like you know like comic book supervillains. And I like that aspect of it. It's like you know. <laughs> I'm going to go back to George Lucas here. It's, it's sort of the old George Lucas of I'm going to take and, I'm going to pick and choose elements of va- various fantasy that I like, and I'm going to mash them up together. I'm going to produce this thing, and hey, look, it's popular. Uh, the other thing about the this series of episodes that you uh, that you hit on, uh, Tanjiro has to think his way through problems. Yeah, and this is something that 
this has been a problem. This was a uh, problem might be exaggerating the point, but a very, very common trope in uh, a lot of shonen stuff in particular. The Our plucky protagonist runs up against an obstacle they can't beat and obtain a power up through, uh, again, a little bit of their, a combination of their training, uh, some kind of emotional beat. And then just with this kind of quasi-emotional catharsis, they receive a giant love, uh, boost in power and overcome the adverse the, uh, the adversary. That's over 9,000! <laughs> sure. That's, I was at, you know, that's the only not, time I've not... ever gotten that joke was when Ronda Rousey wore, wore the shirt at WrestleMania. <laughs> it's no idea what it was. Uh, the... Yeah, it's the, they either learn a new technique that is more powerful or they just get more power. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, if you want... Work... Hang on. If you want the worst, one of the worst examples of this actually is Bleach, where every arc concludes with just a big angry yell from our hero as he powers up to another level and then overcomes something that he shouldn't be able to overcome. Yeah, I Adding can't the, do this. I, I can't do an entire show or movie or anything where it's just incessant, like, fighting and... It's it's the it's the problem I have with a lot of like Marvel comics and, and some to some degree DC where you get, end up with I'm gonna say this and Robert's gonna go is Robert's gonna yell at me about the Hulk but I can't okay. deal with like the over the never ending overpowered hero or villain to where it just gets ridiculous after a while and it's like all you you know that, that's why I said being able to figure out the puzzle and solve the problem and then punch your way out of it is great just you know, strength upon strength upon strength upon strength, and suddenly that's all this is go- going on forever. I can't deal with it. Uh, first of all, yes, you're a flaming hypocrite because that is all the Hulk is. <laughs> <laughs> Lies. <laughs> Lies. Dude, you're, how you deal with your cognitive dissonance is your own problem. <laughs> um, one of the things, but what this, uh, what Demon Slayer does in this particular instance, it draws a little bit of inspiration from one of the first stories from one of the first manga that actually seemed to actively eschew the I scream loud and power up and then this allows me to overcome my adver- my adversary or whatever other kind of adversity I'm facing. Uh, in this particular case, Lord forgive me if anyone out there wishes to yell at me about this, but one of the great things that uh, JoJo's did was introduce the thinking protagonist. And... Uh, I mean, that's the entire gimmick behind, uh, that's the entire greatness of the gimmickry behind Stan. Some of them are stupidly overpowered in very niche circumstances. So you have, so you have to think of a way around them. And then you can, uh, and after you've kind of solved these, you know, the mystery or the puzzle, then you can execute some kind of plan to try and overcome them. But there is always that element to it. So you get a little bit of the same here with Demon Slayer, where, Tanjiro has to figure out, A, what ability these creatures have, and then B, how do I, you know, how can I overcome this? That said, Demon Slayer is certainly not immune from the, I'm in over my head, activate plot armor BS. Uh, our ran- the fact, hey, I happen to randomly be descended from a family that, uh, you know, developed sun breathing and this will become very very important later and now in my moment of it does explain how he just happened to live next to someone that could teach him how to be a demon slayer he didn't live next to the guy who taught him how to be a demon slayer they traveled for they had to travel to a whole other mountain well still one mountain away we don't know how far away the other mountain was we just had to go a chicken in every pot and a demon slayer on every mountaintop uh Okay, uh, point being, again, this show is not immune from that. It just is a bit more sparing in its usage of it, which, again, restraint in this case is, in fact, a very good thing. But I, I'm with you. I like I like that they have to think their way out. I, I like when you can follow the thought process, when it's not just, again, random plot armor that pops up. And on the odd occasion that it is random plot armor, you better have a, you better be able to do something with that later. So and, we're not... So we're nine episodes into this, David, and one of the things that become that that's a, that's a style issue that became very uh, apparent to me, and I want to get your opinions on the previous episodes, but I also want you to talk about this. Um, I asked Lily earlier, like, did they just take just rip the the manga apart and just start pasting pictures on uh, on a storyboard because 
and I don't know if all animes do this, though the few that I've seen seem to, but the idea of um, an unexpressed thought just doesn't, <laughs> never happens. Every, they are narrating every thought, every move, every, I don't think there's quiet in the entire anime series. No, th th yeah, th nobody is standing around thinking, and um, it's just, they have to narrate every single thing they do. Is that a style thing? Is that limited to this? And if, Go ahead. And if there is a silence, a character has to scream. <laughs> <laughs> and right. usually it's Zenitsu. Uh, yeah, well, the, what we have to start off with is manga. Like, manga predates anime, and... You know, manga is prime. Like it's hard to show motion in manga. Like your primary means of storytelling is still pictures and dialogue. Right. So yeah, in the manga, to explain everything that's going on, there's a lot of dialogue. This is why you usually get you know two characters fight, and then you have your sort of sub characters all standing in the peanut gallery at the side of the fight, explaining right. to the point of view character what's going on. Oh, you know, he's using this technique against that, and oh, now he's injured in this way, and he can't do that, and he's only got three minutes before Kevin he dies. Smith. You know, like... Yeah, I read yeah. Kevin Smith's Daredevil. I get why you have to do that in comics. Yeah, <laughs> so... The art of adaptation, no? Yeah, so the vast majority of anime are based off of manga, and in fact, they are used to promote the manga. Okay. You know, which is one of the reasons why a lot of anime don't really have satisfying endings because like they've decided that it's not worth it to make the anime anymore. Just everyone go read the manga. <laughs> you know, we, we've done our thing. You know, the adventure yeah. continues, please buy manga. So, or they run out of manga to adapt. Yeah. This is where we get into the infamous filler arc where they've, they will often try and strike where the iron's hot and try and make the anime almost shortly after the manga gains some popularity but you run into the problem of they make the anime story faster than the manga story gets made so you know they can't stop making the anime because then you know you lose that momentum and they can't write the story faster so they have to make their own original stories which tend to be for the most part no way near as good as the original yeah this is and, a game of thrones fiasco yeah yeah well, almost that sort of thing except game of thrones is a, game of thrones is a little bit different uh game of thrones came up as ostensibly, and I, I do not know the ending to Martin's written story at all. I don't even think he does. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think Martin does either. But point being... Not anymore. You, you, again, like Dave said, you run into two potential problems. What, you run into that problem where you have two, a very popular manga being adapted into a very popular anime, and if they're running more or less concurrently... What do you do when you run out of stuff to... When you run out of story? You either create filler... Now, filler in this case has very specific limitations put on it. You are not allowed to you're not allowed to actually do anything that might affect any of the characters <laughs> because you don't know what the source material is going to be doing lit with any of them later. So you can't have one of them die or leave the scene or anything like that. Everything has to be very very self-contained. Very you can't have any major emotional development. Yeah. Because you might undercut something that the that the author is intending to do, so you can go with the filler. You can go with filler to pad things out. Again, see Naruto, One Piece. Uh, those two, those two are again some of the primary. It, it, they're very obvious examples. The I other mean, it's not all bad. Like uh, without no. filler, we never would have learned how Goku got his driver's license. That's <laughs> true. That's a real very thing. True. <laughs> That's very true. Okay, go ahead and finish up your point, David, so we can move on. Yeah, and I'm uh, to say something yeah. Well. yeah. Another issue is the way that anime is made is the studios don't necessarily have a core group of animators that stay with the studio. A lot of this is sort of contracted work. So if you stop the production of the show, then everyone has to go off and look for more work, and it's very hard to get the band back together for when the show starts up again. Mm -hmm. So and. And also, as as Robert mentioned, you when you often see a movie based off of a Shonen Jump property, it's the same issue: is they want to have the movie and the money, but they don't want to, you know, cross over with the main storyline. So you end up getting some, you know, original work, which typically involves the main characters meeting some young woman, typically voiced by a singer whose album they want to promote, and that character gets the development instead of our our heroes. Well, so, the other thing, the other thing you can do, and there's a very clear example of this as well. If you watch the original Full Metal Alchemist anime, the first 16 or so episodes of that are brilliant. 
and deal mostly with established stuff from the manga. Then they caught up to the manga. The manga was, I think, on hiatus or coming out slowly. And rather than wait, then again, you can either go with filler, put the anime on hiatus, in which case, again, like David said, a lot of the animators will potentially will have to go do other stuff because they have bills to pay. Or well, you bills can... to almost pay. Sure. <laughs> yeah, Creditors to keep at bay, however you choose to do that. Or you can create your own end. And the, the origi- again, the original Full Metal Alchemist anime does that. It is not, after those first like 16 episodes or so, it's not canon anymore. Uh, that said, it, it does do the first 16 episodes better than Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Brotherhood just after that point is much stronger because, hey, it's dealing with, you know, the original vision of the adaptation. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah, so... Uh, oh, sorry, are, are you finished? No, no, there? go ahead, you're good. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, so to get back to the show itself, like uh, Mark, you were talking about how you th- you saw that the different powers of the characters to be very sort of American superhero related, yeah. which is quite interesting because this sort of storytelling, this is like almost ancient. Well, it's like decades old. You know, like this this has been seen in in many Japanese shows dating way back before the superhero boom of the two thousands. So. Like as Mar- as uh, sorry, Robert and I mentioned, you know, like Dragon Ball Z is sort of infamous for having these huge long fight arcs where almost nothing happens. I think someone once timed it out that Goku takes about five hours to throw a punch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but again, and and, and, take- and thankfully in in more modern shows they've they've gotten a lot better at dealing with that. Whereas yeah, now you typically like the longest of fights lasts three, maybe four episodes tops, and then they move on. Yeah, and uh, another issue you're saying about how not a whole lot happens in these fights is also, like, it costs a lot of effort to animate movement. So they kind of have to use all these little tricks to give you the illusion of movement or stuff happening whilst without having to do lots of animation that way. Like the infamous speed lines that you see in a lot of shows are sort of to do that. So it's it's quite rare where you'll get a show where they'll actually take the time to map out, choreograph, and animate an entire fight. When they do, it's amazing, but that usually doesn't happen. It's just not. Uh, sh- yeah, and and I, and I think CG as as they get better at integrating it is sort of helping to add that in. Like this was a very dynamic fight. Uh, the only real thing I would add to this arc is the introduction of uh, Tamayo and Yushiro. The sort of demon doctor who doesn't eat people and has found a way to live without eating people. And uh, Yushiro, her perpetually uh, frustrated, notice me senpai assistant, who's just so clingy and uh, and pining for her and so hostile to anyone who gets the remotest of affection from Tamayo, which they make good use of for, for comedy gold. But yeah, it's it's a good introductory first fight. You know, we learn a bit more about demons and how to fight them. Um, I thought the the way the water techniques are animated to look like the you know Hokusai Ukiyo-e paintings is is really well done. What is that in fifty words or less? Uh, an Ukiyo-e painting. Yes. So Ukiyo-e is an art form which you have seen. Like if if I say think of a Japanese painting, you're probably thinking of a Ukiyo-e. And they're made by taking wooden blocks, carving the reverse of the image into them for each color. And then you roll a paint roller over them and then you stamp them all over each other on a sheet of paper and it will generate like a fully colored scene. Okay. You know, the most famous ukiyo-e artist being Hokusai, who did a lot of paintings of Mount Fuji and his most famous work is The Great Wave, which again, I'm sure you've seen with like the little fishing boats and the giant wave. Like, it, you know, it's everywhere. So I, like you get that sort of feeling from when they do the water effects for the for the water techniques that Tanjiro uses. Okay. Lily, you wanted it one. You you just sort of mumbled that that something was your favorite. So re- say that again loudly with feeling. And then there was something else you wanted to add, and then we'll move on. Yeah, it, it's a fight to get 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 time on this podcast. You got to be aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> the way painting you said is one of my favorite paintings, and. Going back to the, um, the thing where I said that it was only the, the pictures that were kind of different from the anime, I realized now, I was thinking back to something I read. When they did the Taisho era secrets, 
they were a lot different in the manga than they were in the other anime. They did a little talking scene and then they said it. But for this, they... The writer of the manga created a mini character that appears during the Taisha Secrets and he says the he draws a picture of what they're talking of what he's gonna talk about and then he says the secret, so that's what I realized that was different. So I yeah, and uh, sorry, just one last point. Just yeah, to go ahead. to how before Lily you were mentioning how the art of the anime looks a bit different than the art in the manga. I haven't read the manga, so I don't know for sure, but a lot of the time is character designs will get sort of simplified and redone to make them easier to animate. Like you just think of having to redraw that same character over and over and over again, slightly different positions to animate it. You know, like with some manga artists, their art is so intricate, so detailed that to do that would just be cost prohibitive. It would take forever to animate. So they'll often simplify the characters a bit to make them easier to animate. Okay. I want to take this opportunity right now to uh, talk to you a little bit about Grammarly. You, <laughs> this is going to say, uh, remind everyone of our sponsor. <laughs> Good job. <Yeah. laughs> for, you, for you listeners of the uh, TV Party Tonight Rattling and Broadcasting Podcast and all of our great listeners on the W2M Network, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching a, uh, contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. Lily, you could use Grammarly to do your English homework. Do you know that? Yes, but I don't think I have English homework. You have ESL. Right. Yell it. Yell it, whatever. Oh, <laughs> yes. you, you better ace ESL, Lily. <laughs> yes, Lily, you could use Grammarly to help you with your ELA work. Don't you write short stories? Yes. Yes? What I, kind of stories do you write, Lily? I write fan fiction, and I make up my own stories about... Is it Sam and Frodo gay uh, slash fiction? Oh! Huh? Um, <laughs> huh? that, that was for Alexis. Do, Hi, Alexis. Do not... Do not. Just don't. It's a saturated market. Don't bother. Yeah, like, if, if, there's no way you're, gonna, you're even going to make a splash in that particular market. <laughs> so in, in 50 words or less, what kinds of things do you write about, Lily, that you could use Grammarly for? Um, I write a lot about characters that, would, that other people would re relate to mm -hmm. or something I've watched mm -hmm. i just put them in my own i put them in my own version that's funny when i was a kid um i used to do the same thing so i read a lot of like spider-man and fantastic four and um for Eng for my english class when they called it english and not whatever the hell you just said ELA. Um, that's the one um we would read things like the lottery or we would re read catcher in the rye and stuff like that and so my take was to take marvel comic heroes and put them in classic literature i think uh, i did one of the mice and men too so it's fun that you and i kind of do the same things all these years. i assume you had doctor strange kill the hulk and uh, like <laughs> that was your take on of mice and men at <laughs> sure. the end of at the end of it ju just just sit here bruce and uh, just think about them just you know <laughs> Think about the rabbits. You were uh, so close, Mark. If you had just thought of like doing Pride and Prejudice with zombies, you would have you would have been making that money. But... Right. I'd be in, I'd be rich and famous. I wouldn't be doing this podcast right now. Um, yeah. to go to Grammarly, Mice and Men and the Hulk, I guess that just didn't quite do it. No. Spider-Man and the Lottery didn't quite yeah. uh, get working. You need to keep things in the public domain. <laughs> uh, download Grammarly. Go to getgrammarly.com, W2M Network. Again, that's getgrammarly.com. W2 and Network to download Grammarly for free on us, the Rattle and Broadcasting Network and the W2M Network right here on TV Party tonight. All right, moving on. Um, so we have a bridge episode, um, episode number 10, uh, where at the end of it is where we read uh, Zenitsu, and then it opens up with Zenitsu, and he is harassing a girl and saying, my God, won't you marry me? And <laughs> That's what makes me hate Zenitsu. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I, you have a lot. You seem to have a lot of passion here for this. Like, just go ahead. I'm not even gonna. I'm not even going to set this up. Just go. Zenitsu is one of those characters that he may be a main character, but I feel like a lot of things he does would get people annoyed. Like my dad doesn't like him because he screams every time he has to speak. 
screams, me. cries, whines. <laughs> we went the the kind of cinematic whiplash. We go from Aragon giving the speech at the Black Gates and Return of the King. And, uh, yeah, you would. I would see the faces that would take the heart of me. But it is not this day to. <laughs> Ugh. Oh, I don't want to fight the demons. Oh, please, someone marry me. I'm going to die. Oh, that is something I did not like. When he was harassing that woman earlier, I got so angry. And the fact that the dude was chasing, the dude was chasing Nezuko, the, the, like, when they were at the Whimsia, Whimsica house. Wisteria, maybe? Wisteria. Wisteria. Oh, that was it. Wisteria. It's a plant. <laughs> he literally chased her the entire time and then started chasing Tondro. Then Inosuke comes in and started chasing all, to both of them, and it really annoyed me. Dave, why is this a thing? Why do we need to have overly emotional, wimpy, opposite of Aragorn characters? <laughs> oh boy, um, I'm not entirely sure I can answer this for you, but uh, <laughs> I guess I guess I'll start off with yeah, like the trope of the uh, sort of horn dog male character that's always chasing all the girls that in hang on in fairness to zenitsu he's not the horniest guy in the world he's more paranoid about dying and given his profession that seems rational and would and is just trying to live everything that he can before that happens well hang on later on in the show they get they they do a whole thing where you know he got himself into debt he explains a little bit of it here but later on we'll actually see the backstory in a flashback he's like i am only doing this because I, I was sort of manipulated into it out of, you know, in effect of getting out of debt. This isn't something he wants to do. And it is. And yeah, he's paranoid. He's going to die. But he didn't want to do this in the first place. It's not like, you know, he didn't join the service and he's anxious that, you know, the service may be the end of him, which would be one thing and nothing I would make fun of. This is I didn't want to do it in the first place. I'm being made to do it. And I hate every single minute of it, which I guess that's funny, but I I wanted to every time he was on screen, and the more it's, he was on, more often he was on screen, I wanted to just bang my head into the wall. Yeah, it's a good motivation for the character, but yeah, like the whole yeah the yeah the, the that that character that's trying to be a lady killer is it's sort of a comedic trope. Like you've got, you've got Moroku and Inuyasha, you got Master Roshi and Dragon Ball, and of course the joke is they never succeed. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, the, like they always get their comeuppance. Hey, is that hey? Zenith's just going to succeed. I know what happens. Okay. Well, I, I have not seen the story <laughs> past this, but again, I'm just sort of pointing out sort of to try and address that. And I'm just going to file that one under cultural differences. Apparently in Japan, that's considered funny. I, and, I was going to say, do, does Japan have a thing for crying men? Because I feel like this is everywhere every time I turn around. Yeah. I'm not so sure of that because I, I agree with you. Like He is the most annoying character to me. And usually that kind of character who's you know, not there because they want to be like their arc is usually learning. This is my lot. You know, if I want to survive, I need to toughen up or just like to sort of be a quote unquote man. They decide, you know, I need to become a better person. I need to learn how to fight and not run away from everything. What uh, bothers me the most about Zenitsu is how he talks really big when he's not in a fight. (laughs) You know, like, like after the fight's over, he's like, yeah, Lucky I was here. I sure defeated all those demons. Hey, I think one of those is still like, oh, no, Tanjiro, help me. Please save me. Oh, no, I don't want to die. He's like was... Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, but with a samurai sword. <laughs> I did not, I I did not get that impression. A popular character. Oh, hold on, hold on. I didn't get that impression from what he... Uh, Inosuke's the braggart. I thought... My thing with uh, Zenitsu was, you know, he when he passes out, he can fight in his sleep because he is yeah, very that, unconsciously competent. Why he's not dead. Like what? Yeah, but he. Now I I never got that he was the one going. Boy, sure. Unless this was an issue between sub and dub, yeah, I never. There, there's been one or two types. Of, I mean, he's not nearly as bad as Usopp in One Piece, who just acts like he's the man and solely Dude. responsible for all their victories. Us- but the moment anything goes bad, he just freaks out. And again, his fights are like eighty percent him running and screaming. Oh, woe is me. Hey, and, but Usopp, look, Usopp at least does kind of develop over time. And to be fair to Zenitsu, he will as well. Yeah, but it's, but yeah, Usopp's, Zenitsu, comedy is, Usopp's comedy is also less grating than Zenitsu's. Yeah, but yeah, I, I agree. Like he's, I find him really annoying. Yeah, hope, I guess, 
uh, Robert has said that he he will get better, which is good. It's it's when that character doesn't evolve that that bothers me. But the fact of the matter is, we're all wrong because apparently, due to Shonen Jump character popularity polls, he's the most popular character in Japan. Are you wait seriously? Seriously, yeah. Zen- Zenitsu, the blonde kid. Yep. I'm never yep. going to Japan. I don't get that country. Y'all are weirdos. Hey, well, that's this, only, this only applies to people who vote in uh, character popularity polls in Shonen Jump. I, what, I'll going, what other characters was he going against? Because if they were Everyone. Like, every other character in the show. When, when they do those, they put up every character. Uh, uh, not so. I'm not terribly surprised. Uh, you might be surprised to know that w- they do these for pretty much every show. Uh, very the protagonist is the is everyone's favorite character very very rarely uh i can't really? yeah tanjiro is not everyone's favorite demon slayer character luffy's not everyone's favorite luffy might be i'd have to double check on luffy he'd be the he'd be the exception though Lu- um like naruto is not anyone's favorite naruto character actually <laughs> yeah he's naruto, not my favorite character naruto comes in second or third in his own show uh was the other? Uh, uh, Gone is not everyone's favorite character in Hunter Hunter. He's third. Uh, yeah. He, he, all right. So but, just, depending but, on where you are, you haven't. Depending on where you are in Hunter Hunter, you haven't met the most popular character yet. All right. Listen, we got to. So, uh, I'm just going with cultural difference. I wish I could explain it too. I, yeah. I got <laughs> Robert. I need like 20 words or less on Zenitsu, and then we got to move on to Man Bear Pig, and then we just got to keep going, plowing through this. Uh. I I find his character, I, I'm with you, I find him grating. I'm hoping that they're able to kind of do him a little bit of justice as the show goes on. Uh, again, he gets better. He in it's, in it's heavily implied he does, in fact, wind up with Nezuko after it's all said and done. So hopefully he's less of a whatever he is by the time that comes <laughs> around. All right. Um, so I keep calling him Man Bear Pig. It's, his name is uh, Inosuke. Inosuke oh, Hashibara. Mark. Yes, sir. It's Inosuke. I know <laughs> that you look. I know that you look at the pronunciation and you want to throw the uh, S U K E. It's not. Yeah, for a while I was doing that with Asuka um, because of the way they spell. I her. know you wanted to say her name was Asuka. No, it, right. she's Asuka. Inosuke. There's any number of examples of this. Got it. Inosuke Hanna Barbera. I got it. Hashibara. I'll, I'll allow for I'll allow for Hanna Barbera. <laughs> you do, and you'll clean it up. Um, I stole that one from Jim Cornette. Uh, so I love this character, I and mean, as much as I don't enjoy characters incessantly screaming at the camera, um, I I at least can appreciate a character who's like, you know, enough with the bullshit. Let's fight. And that's all he is. That that is him through and through. So, and so this episode where they're this episode had two things I like. One, it was the introduction of Inosuke. Um, and I, you know, and I've talked about how I I appreciate that character. If I'm gonna have a one-dimensional character trait character, that's at least one I can appreciate. Two, this is probably also my favorite demon. I love the beat on the drums, the room changes direction thing. Yeah, it's one what? of my favorites. Once again, another brilliant use of the three-dimensional uh, terrain that they're able to kind of draw on. Yeah. When I first started watching the show, I actually thought Dad would actually like Inosuke because they have kind of similar. <laughs> they're both, they're both There's a demon over there. I'm going to hit it with my sword. That didn't work. There's a demon over there. I'm going to hit it with my sword. That didn't work. There's a demon over there. I'm going to hit it with my sword. <laughs> the hilarious thing about what my daughter just said was when I played D&D as a kid, I got nicknamed Bait McTrapspringer <laughs> <laughs> because I would always play warrior type characters. Who, and, I, and no matter how many times I was told, don't do this, I didn't listen and would run headfirst into the dungeon, <laughs> mostly setting <laughs> off traps or alerting all the enemy that we were there. Now, so, now yeah, Mark, are, 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 you so much, like, are you so much of a tough guy that you are ashamed of your feminine facial features that you have to wear a hollowed out boar's head that's yeah, not why he. That's not why he wears the boar mask. Yeah, it's not. Because pig is delicious. No, I don't. No, think it, I mean, oh, it, yeah. no. I just find it funny that hang on, hang on, hang on. the mask he's actually like looks like a very has a very nice face. Yeah, he's a very pretty man. Do you want to know why he actually wears it? In ten words or less. 
He was raised by wild boars. The brief flashback we get is his mother dropping him into water to escape being attacked by demons. He is found by a batch of wild boars. That's actually his mother's head. His, his adopted boar mother's head that he's wearing around. Oh, that's cool. All right, so... That's very well-spoken boars. So in the interest of time... Look, how he learned to speak, I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, let's not think too much about this. Do you, do you have anything else you want to talk about with NSK in this episode? I say NSK is definitely one of those characters that when he was he's he's a reckless character, but he's so hilarious. Anytime he says something, I'll, I laugh because it's either a funny thing he said or he did something. And the same way they were all like the. The two brothers were telling their little sister to look away while Inosuke was banging his head into a tree. I thought that was kind of hilarious, kind of funny because that would be what I did if someone was banging their head to a tree. I'd be, I would be asking what were they doing. Uh, all right, Robert, real like twenty words, and then David jump right in there. Um, see you guys. See if you guys can talk over each other if possible. Inosuke, go. Robert, he said your name first. Okay. Well, he also wanted us to talk over each other, so I was going <laughs> to... I'm not going to do that. No. I ruined the All right. Uh, yeah, I, I... Inosuke is kind of the character I get the most mileage out of as a viewer. Uh, Tanjiro, for all the kind of good that there is about him, in terms of his... He's a little bit flat in some respects, and... Again, this is not necessarily... You don't want him to be completely over the top. He's meant to be a more thoughtful, reflective character. You do kind of need a catalyst, though. You need somebody who is over the top in a way that is more engaging than the pseudo-comedy of Zenitsu. So here we have a very clear catalyst, a character obsessed with strength. Again, this is another very, very common trope for anything in, in, anything even remotely adjacent to the genre. <laughs> Uh, the desire to get stronger. Uh, he's a lot of fun. He, uh, we get to see a little bit of, towards the end of the season, you know, a little bit more of his character. We again, just a touch of his backstory. We start learning a little bit about some of his, uh, you know, character foibles. It's not just that he's obsessed with strength; he's ashamed of weakness. And who isn't? Uh, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> There's too many ways I could poke fun at you. Oh. And so, again, we get to see a little bit of that with him starting to come through that will hopefully, again, be more developed as the in the second season, which is inevitable at this point. Uh, yeah, and his he's played for comedy most of the time, but a little bit a little bit unlike Zenitsu. Zenitsu's. Zenitsu's comedy doesn't lean as mu lead as much towards potential catharsis in a in a way. In his case, does you know when he when he starts getting depressed about his utter failures, you can understand why, and it, it does kind of make you root for the guy a little bit. To, okay, yeah, this sucked. We all feel bad for you, but let's you know you can you can dust yourself off. You can try again. You can do better next time. Uh, whereas with Zenitsu, most of the time when he's freaking out, you just kind of want him to shut the hell up. Go ahead, Dave. Jump in. Yeah, I I find Inosuke to be a bit annoying, uh, but certainly way less than uh, Zenitsu. I'd, I'd much rather watch scenes with Inosuke than Zenitsu. And then the other kind of like the opposites of each other. Zenitsu is a complete and total coward, whereas Inosuke is just obsessed with fighting to the point of not thinking at all. Yeah, so you 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 would have that situation where it's just like, okay, this demon's really powerful. Now, you know, if we all like, you'll go to opposite ends, and we like work on a coordinate track. Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> yep. It's like, well, that's guess a, we're fighting that's now. A little Warcraft joke, Lily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I just dated myself a lot. <laughs> so this, but, yeah, I, I don't have that much to say about Inosuke. I mean, he's so far not. There's not that much to him. He's just like. You know the oaf that charges in, no matter what, and yeah, I'm okay. glad to hear that there there will be more backstory and development given to him in the future. All right, so this gets us through episode 14, where we um, we've introduced our main core characters. Now we've 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 put together the band of heroes, and with it as as a group, as a as a D and D uh, group, 
They are now off on their first mission. And this is where the show starts to lose me. Me too. I got so angry during that, like half of that episode. So what I'm talking about is this whole bit with Mount Natagumo and the spider demon monkey. De- uh, yeah, the spider clan. Yeah. This go- one, these episodes seemingly went on forever. This story arc seemingly went on forever. And there was a couple of, it wasn't all bad. There was a couple of good bits about it. But just a couple of points of note. As a group of episodes, the good, the bad, and the ugly for me, I actually, the, the bit where Zanetsu fights the spider um, and has to summon a degree of courage to get through it um, and then nearly dies, I was like, okay, I kind of like that episode. Um, he wasn't as bad as I thought he could be. I mean, he wasn't great, certainly in the beginning where he was doing the shaggy routine where he was a coward. Um, the fight between the, the the brother who's just looking for a family, well, I found his backstory interesting and his motivations interesting the actual fight itself went on for 87 hours <laughs> and you know it, it didn't quite have the same feel as tondro and the demons with the uh with the balls this felt less solving the puzzle and more video game boss yeah where you know it's it's you have to defeat the boss once then the boss regenerates and, and becomes p- more powerful. You got to beat him again, and then you got to do it a third time. Um, and, and you know the resolution being the demon art blood and the, the thematically the idea of you can't separate me and what's the sister's name? Nezuko. Nezuko. Uh, our bond is too strong. We are we we are one and too great, and therefore we defeat all. It was a nice. It was a nice theme. I liked that element of it. I don't know how well it was executed. It's certainly up to that point. The whole story here starts to lose my interest. Um, Lily, I'm going to give you one more shot at this. This whole grouping of episodes that deals with the spider folk. Um, what'd you think, real quick? It kind of made me sad when I first started watch to watch it because the when he when Tanjiro is using the water breathing and flame breathing techniques, and then Nezuko comes in with her de- blood demon art. I thought it was so cool. And, but then after I, and he said that his head was already cut off and then Tamioka comes in and ends up cutting it off anyway. I thought it was all for nothing. When, because they just wasted time with it, but it still was cool to watch. Robert, this grouping of episodes. Uh, I have a great joke, but none of you will get it, and I'm now sad. Why? Well, again, why would that stop you now? Fair enough. Uh, you thought there was going to be so, you thought there was going to be some resolution to that fight, but it was me, Dio. And again, <laughs> none of you will get that. <laughs> Maybe Dave. Muda, 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 muda. Hey, come on, he cut. Look, he you're you're literally the spot on. So I laughed anyway. He looked, he literally cut his own head off to avoid dying. That's literally what Dio does. Never mind. <laughs> but yet, yet Tamayoko was able to cut it off and the demon was dead. Well, th- again, he, cu- he was able to avoid it the first time because he saw that Tanjiro was going to do it, so he cut his own head off to avoid his head being cut off by the Sacred Blade. He didn't react fast enough when Tomio did it. Okay. In fact, that's rather expressly stated. Uh, I'm with you in that this felt a little bit long. Uh, I think there's a better, I think there are better ways to execute this, but I loved the design of all the spider demons. There's some genuinely horrifying stuff here. Uh, so kudos to everybody involved with that. Uh, some of the fight scenes were pretty good. Uh, again, the problem we ran into, like you mentioned, this is our, this is our video game boss. And the only way to overcome it is rather than technique and strategy is oh hey by the way remember that fun that funny dance our dad used to do yeah it turns out that unlocks the secret of sun breathing and my plot armor activates very briefly <laughs> uh that said i think that's the, that's basically going to be the last time that happens i think the only other pseudo instance of that is going to be when he figured uh 
later on, but even then it won't, I don't think it'll come up in the same kind of way. Uh, yeah, the, you know, the characters are, the demons are suitably tragic. Some of them are suitably scary. Uh, and there, there's some decent fights. Uh, some of them are well put together. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you in that. I think the, I think the only real problem is the length. I think there's probably about a full episode you could have trimmed out of this if you had tightened some, uh, some parts of it up. But. Yeah, I would say this is like a five episode arc and it, it just so so yeah, it starts with fifteen and it it roughly ends with twenty and half of twenty one. Yeah, on the plus side it does transit this actually transitions well into the next arc. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather than because you know, previously it's like the crow shows up and hey, here's your next mission, which is fine. But it also does it also uh, can create some pretty glaring uh yeah, a very it, it creates very hard chops in the story. Here it's oh, the people in charge of this whole thing have found out that I'm working with a demon. You know, this should this immediately leads to consequence. Who'd have thought? Yeah, like with the sort of shonen structure of things, usually the first couple of arcs are there just more to establish the story to get an audience and get it established as a property that the the magazine supports. And then sort of after that point, it kind of gets the go ahead and then you see it opening up a lot more. The world expands, gets a lot more fleshed out. And yeah, the fights get bigger, higher stakes, and they tend to last longer. So I think this is one instance of that happening is we're sort of taking our first steps into the bigger Demon Slayer world. Even though this series doesn't go on for as long as a lot of other shonen titles. Like no, it, it's finished it its, re- its run in Japan. Yeah, it wrapped up uh, December of 2020. I think the English adaptations, uh, the English translations will be, uh, they might already be done, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, but, so yeah. First, first quarter of this year. So, yeah, it had a very, by Shonen standards in particular, it had a very concise story. Yeah, which I'm not against. It's kind of nice to have a story that, you know, goes through and wraps up. Like, we don't want this to be like Inuyasha, where they're still fighting the same demon after 150 episodes. Oh, that sounds yeah. interminable. Or Naruto, where he spends 150 episodes figuring out one technique. I would yeah. kill myself. I would. I don't even <laughs> think you're reading that right now. Wait, what? He yeah. just said Naruto is 100 and some odd episodes of figuring out one technique. Yeah, at least the anime. I, I think the, the manga would be better because the anime it's, is it's incredibly better. infamous for uh, extensive filler arcs, like hundreds of episodes of filler. Yeah. It got uh, so bad they had to basically cancel the show and start a new show picking up from when the manga... That, that's you know, why you, that's again. why you have that's why you have Naruto and Naruto Shippuden. <laughs> yeah, it, it uh, just got so bad they needed to to distance themselves from that. But uh, yeah, the fights I'd say there's nothing terribly yeah terribly unique or interesting. Yeah, the spiders are freaky. It seems to be more just you know it's establishing where things are going to go next. Like yeah, Tanjiro's father apparently has some connection with demon hunting, which also explains why Muzan freaks out over his earrings uh, that much. It's, it's not his father; it's his. I forget how many generations back. But it's some, anyway, some, he's, some iteration of great grandfather actually almost killed Muzan because again, sun breathing. Okay, I got the generation, wrong, but you, you get the point. It's in, in his family background. That's, a, that's actually why he attacked their family to begin with. Uh, Muzan is trying to create a demon that is immune to sunlight so he can then eat them and gain that power. Okay, and so how does the story just, end, Robert? Just, just tell us. Just rip that know? band-aid off. No. <laughs> that was sarcasm. Don't, don't ask. I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. Um, David, anything else on that on this uh, part of episodes? Because if not, we're going to move on to this last arc here and then close up shop. Yeah, I think the only other thing is how it's how Nezuko, we see that she apparently has a bit more going on in her head than we initially thought. Granted, up till now, the most she's ever commented on anything is, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, she has well, something in her mouth. Really. Yeah, she, she has a muzzle on, which apparently well, stops no, she her. Make, she makes a good fighting dog character. You she, know? Also, yeah. she also didn't speak for over two years. Uh, even when they unmuzzle her later, uh, she her voice is messed up from just sheer lack of use over that long a period of time. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, so... So yeah, it sort of establishes that there's more stuff going on with Nezuko and Tanjiro with their abilities, and I assume that will be developed later. And yeah, then it sort of ends with the introduction of uh, the Hashira and the the demon slaying core. We sort of get our full introduction to them, which segues into the next arc. Yes. So um, this ends the, the this ends with them 
um, be, having their wounds taken care of after defeating the spiders and whatnot. Uh, and then they are um, more or less kidnapped and brought before the uh, Harshami. What is it? Who is it? Hashira. Hashiri. Hashira. 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 One more time. <laughs> Hashira. Hashira. Yeah, that was a really good show, by the way. Like if you're, like if you're laughing at that stupid character. Hashira. <laughs> Got it. All right, so he's brought for the Hashira. And then this, this is episodes 22 through 26 here, which is our glorious conclusion. Um, we have a lot of... De- this, is a, this is a talking arc, man. Um, I mean, not one night in Miami talking, but a lot of just kind of debating the merits of whether or not they should let him live for keeping a demon around, whether or not they should let the demon live. There's a, there's a really nice dramatic tension bit where the one guy's got... Um, um, Nezuke in a in a box in the Nezuko. box Nezuko in the box, and he's like, oh, I bet if I fed her blood, she'd jump out and try to kill everybody." And uh, that goes on for a bit, and of course, it doesn't go the way that he wants it to go, and they end up being freed. Um, towards the end of this, we're back with Mugen. What's his face? Muzan. Muzan Kibutsuki. Sure. Uh, our main... Just go with Muzan. You'll never be able to pronounce his other. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never get the other path of that, Mark. Um, so we see, we see Muzan. He does a bit where he kills all of his goons. Or uh, he kills kills two goons, gives the other one extra powers, and says, go get him. And that takes us to the Mugen train. Um, just a quick aside on that, just so I know that I covered it. Uh, the movie was already released. It apparently was a huge hit in Japan. It was like the number one movie over there for 2020. Of all time. Yeah, of all time. Um, take that, Avengers Endgame. So, <laughs> between that and Detective Chinatown 3. Um, in any case, so Could it's... Thought, regional tastes matters. Um, so it's out in, you know, it's out, it was out in Japan. It's been out in other parts of Asia. It just hasn't made its North American release yet. Uh, AMC initially pegged February 26th as the date that Mugen Train was going to come out. That seems to have gone away and now who the knows, knows when. But allegedly it's coming to theaters at some point in 2021. And I'll announce this now. When it does, we'll do a damn you Hollywood on it and we'll have Lily back again. Um, so we'll do a DMU Hollywood on that when it finally gets released. And then after that, season two will be coming out. So let me go over to you first. This is your last bit to comment here. And then we're going to start closing up shop, Lily. These last four episodes with the uh, Hashisha, Hashishami. Uh, yeah. Hashira. The Hashira, yes. Uh, what did you think of how the story ends here? I thought it was really interesting. I really did like the cliffhanger with with Zenitsu, Nezuko, Tandro. Zenitsu, and then the flame Hashira, and then the, and then the, and then the lower one of the twelve Kisaki was a really good cliffhanger, and I and when I saw it, I'm like, I hope they make a movie, and now I, that they are, I'm happy. All right, Robert, take me home. Uh, your final thoughts on the show and the lead into the Mugen Train. Uh. I'm with you in that it took a little bit of time to kind of make its point with all the talking. Uh, That said, we did get enough. You have to kind of counterbalance how much time it takes with also giving up, being being sure you are able to give us enough of the personalities of the relevant characters that we're going to have going forward. Because all of these people are going to be important later. Uh, not Not as important as others, but they all... Uh, they all do show up. We do spend more time with all of them. So we do need to, your introductions do need to serve some kind of purpose as far as that goes. Uh, so you know, trying to counterbalance that, this was not the worst instance of this I've ever seen. David, take me home, baby doll. Yeah. So as I said before, we're expanding the world out and fleshing it out more. So yeah, now we get a bit more of a knowledge of the structure of the Demon Slayer Corps, like the different Hashira and what they do, their leadership. Uh, I like that they sort of dropped that uh, he, uh, like the leader of the Demon Slayers, he he knows of Lady Tamayo. So it seems like you know things are not quite as straightforward as as we were led to believe. But yeah, this was kind of a bit more lighthearted after the long, dark spider arc. Uh, and... Yeah, it just served. It's a training arc, is basically what it is. So, yeah, they, they, yeah, 
What was one aspect they, they, I mentioned? Um, uh, Inosuke, in, Inosuke, you know, having his sort of will broken and having to rebuild it and find his courage again. I actually, for you know, for a character who was mostly just screaming charge at the <laughs> camera, I actually thought they he had the best parts of things to do in these last four episodes. Yeah, I mean, Tanjiro was kind of the leader where he was the one actively trying to train and it's more Zenitsu and Inosuke just sort of follow his lead as they realize he's getting stronger than them. And of course, Inosuke can't handle that. Right. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I thought it was, I, I was quite surprised that when they introduced the, um, I actually forget the name uh, for, uh, yeah, like Muzan's elite group. Uh, really helped me out here. What's uh, Muzan's elite group? The, the twelve cozy, cozy eyes. Twelve Kizuki. Kizuki, thank you. That's the, the, the twelve it. moons. Kizuki. Hmm. The crazy eighty-eight. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was going to go with the gung ho guns or the ten swords, but anyway, or the Ginyu Force. It's actually, if you translate it, it's actually called the twelve moons. Right. The Cleveland Browns. Go. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> These guys have uh, a much better win record than the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I was surprised. Hi, Jesse. But, yeah. I was surprised when Musa just killed all but one of them. I'm like, well, that, that sure saves a lot of time. Uh, and, and, and the only reason the one survived is because they wanted to die. Yeah. So, yes, it please kill me. Nine feel to it. Bob Gunn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just about. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, like it was, it was an okay end. Uh, I'm quite surprised that they're actually adapting the next story arc into a film. That almost never happens. Uh, but I guess I'll just go into overall thoughts of the show. Is like and you, all, the, you also very rarely get a manga that sells 48 million units in a single year. Yeah, like to be honest, I, I'm not super into the show. Like I probably wouldn't be watching it if it wasn't for my wife in this podcast. Uh, not to say it is bad at all. It's you know perfectly fine. I think as Robert mentioned, the fights when they sort of get away from the usual narrated standing and looking at each other shonen trope are quite well done. But yeah, I, I was just scratching my head so much as like, why is it this popular? Because there's nothing in this show I can think of that I haven't seen done before in other things. But David... I mean, this draws so heavily from the most basic of of the hero elements of the hero's journey. That's why, I mean, to go back to the the beginning of this podcast, this is literally Joe Campbell, the animated series. How how can you say you don't know why this is popular? Well, it's not only that, but it also draws from a lot of other stuff, you know, within its own subgenre. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, but, but isn't you know, that what like I look at the twelve Hashira and I see the you know thirteen squad captains of Soul Society in Bleach. Right, you but know. isn't that what we like as humans? We we like you know a papuri, a uh, paella, if you will, of all the other stuff we like individually, just thrown into a bowl. No, well, it's I'm not mystified no, why for, people like it. Most humans I'm do. mystified why this is like the most popular thing ever. That's you know, why. That, that, that's the bit. That's the bit that that confuses well, and, me a bit. Again, I think I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, there, there's a couple of things. There's a few points that are uh, that you can draw very clear lines to, and then there's a little bit of my own kind of speculation going on Robert, here. I, I want to hear this. I want to hear this badly. Fifty words or less. Go. Uh, this is not a fifty words or less thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be as I'll be as succinct as I can. Again, there's a couple of points that kind of went on here. One, you had some very notable internet personalities get behind this and go, this is the best thing ever, very publicly. Yeah. Which is always going to drive interest, especially internationally. Sure. Yeah, I'm thinking more of just in Japan. Um, in Japan, you have... Uh, I'm, like, has it just I, been I think... so long since these elements were used in a show that sort of the new generation isn't used to it so I think this is little, novel to them i think that's a little bit it i mean what we have here in some respects is anytime you wind up with a long-running kind of formulaic uh, format you're always going to have generational gaps and whatever kind of reignites people's passion or catches on anyone who's been around for at least one previous iteration of this cycle is going to look at this and go okay it's it's fine, but it's not 
groundbreaking. It's not earth shattering. It's not, I can think of everything this is drawing from, and I can think of elements where it's been done better. And you might be correct about that. But when you're talking about, again, broadest base appeal, I do think you're getting a little bit of, uh, I mean, you know, for people of you, know, Dave, you and I are kind of about the same age. You know, Dragon Ball Z or Full Metal Alchemist is kind of the show that a lot of people our age watched and went, oh, cartoons can be so much more than Scooby-Doo or the Flintstones, right? Sure. I think with Demon Slayer, we're just getting people, you know, 20 years later, after the genre has had 20 years of playing around with it, uh, stumbling across a very... Uh, a a well-executed uh, example of those same kind of tropes and falling in love with it the same way other people did something, you know, again, 10, 20 years ago, however long you want to go back in time. Like I said, I, I got a... People are going to hear this connection and go like, how? But I got a Star Wars vibe from this, and not because it resembles, in the strictest fashion, Star Wars, but if you think about, like... And this is what, why I said what I said before, and really we got to end on this point. You know, and when, when George Lucas created star wars he was taking all the stuff that was popular that he grew up with from the you know the serialized science fiction shows and you know uh, buck rogers flash gordon uh that sort of thing and kurosawa and a whole bunch of other elements and he threw them together and whether people knew they existed or not they saw them in that film and it became the most popular thing ever that's why i think like like demon slayer feels like a, a reiteration of that formula of hey let's take Let's take things people already like and execute them well in a highly accessible fashion with a, you know, with a whole new group of people and boom, you've got a hit on your hands. Yeah, I, I get all that. It's just, I'm not, I personally cannot see the bit where it sort of goes beyond that. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. again, like, like Star Wars went beyond Flash Gordon, went beyond the Hidden Fortress, Metropolis, like it. Like, are you, are you saying like you're having difficulty seeing where Demon Slayer elevates the medium? Basically, yes. I, I will agree. It is a very solidly well executed story and show. Like, like you know, this isn't me going. Demon Slayer's lame. Like, you know, Dragon Ball Z is so much better. It's it's not not like that. It's Please just <laughs> you know, like, all of these elements are things that are very well established in other sh still popular shows in you know, like in that area of the culture. So I'm kind of wondering why you know, I, again. I have no problem at all with this being a very popular and successful show, but it being like the most popular and successful show, I kind of, I'm scratching my head a bit. Like I, I'm not sure why it has achieved those heights. I, I can kind of understand like maybe with the movie, it's just been, you know, coronavirus. You're like, Hey, this, this fun thing came out in theaters. Let's all go see it. What else are we going to do? But yeah, I, I don't quite understand the level of, of, uh, mania surrounding it and again like everyone enjoying it great fantastic it's it's no way bad it's just yeah like i i see the 12 kizuki and it's like okay it's like the gung-ho guns from trigun or it's the um you know 10 swords from Aroni kenshin you know i i i, I can see all the little bits that have gone into this i just don't see where it's become more than the sum of those parts okay. hey real quick before we end the show for the evening i want to talk about the music which you can actually find on amazonmusic.com you can also listen to some of them on spotify shut up spotify doesn't exist um but it does. they're not yeah. a sponsor <laughs> yeah <laughs> Look, so if, if spotify wants to give us money to read their ad copy we'll include them however amazon music is a great service where you can actually find i don't know how to pronounce this woman's name but garange is that right david uh, I would have to see it written. G Gurenge, maybe? G-U-R-E-N-G-E. -E. Yeah, Gurenge. Gurenge. So Gurenge um, wrote a song, and it was used as the opening theme song for, the, uh, for this series, Demon Slayer. And you can actually find that on uh, AmazonMusic.com. And if you click on the link that will be provided in the description of this podcast... Get amazonmusic.com slash W2M network. You can sign up for a free 30 days of Amazon Music. And you can check out 
all the artists, uh, including Garenge, who are associated with Demon Slayer, and check out all the music that is there on AmazonMusic.com. Great service. Use it all the time to listen to all the music. As a matter of fact, today, uh, my son was upset that he, was, he had the Sunday blues because tomorrow was school. It's the end of the weekend. And I said, but Jonas, everybody's working for the weekend. And we went right to AmazonMusic.com and listened to Loverboys. Everybody's working for the shut up, Lily. Everybody's working for the weekend, <laughs> and we did. And he was all happy after that. He was like, "You're right, Dad. Everybody is working for the weekend." Get AmazonMusic.com. All right. Um, so for my my daughter, this is the last bit we're going to talk about here, and then we're we're gonna. I'm literally just stopping the show. Um, we're gonna do. We'll do plugs. Robert, your top five. If you like Demon Slayer, you'll like go. Jeez. If you can't answer this question within 10 seconds, I'm moving on to David. Um, it's going to kind of come down to what you like about Demon Slayer. It's pretty. Go. Oh, if we're just talking quality of animation? No, 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 no. Um, well, you heard what Lily liked about Demon Slayer. She thought it was interesting. She thought, uh, you know, she liked the hero's journey. So top 10 things. If you like Demon Slayer and the hero's journey, you should watch what? Top five. Uh, well, I mean, the obvious answer is just kind of the other big shonen manga. So Hunter Hunter, uh, Bleach, Naruto, One Piece. Uh, the only one of those I might actually kind of recommend is One Piece. I don't care nearly as much for Bleach or Naruto as other people, but individual tastes will vary wildly. If you're drawn a little bit more towards uh, again what you can do with uh, 3D animation... I do personally enjoy Attack on Titan, uh, and for the record, Dave's kind of joke about Aaron aside, we all know Armin is the protagonist of that show, Dave, come on. David, oh, yeah, I said, I said protagonist, Aaron's the villain. David, what would you recommend? Uh, I would recommend, uh, going a bit back, uh, Ruroni Kenshin, uh, right. sometimes known as Samurai X, that has a lot of, hits a lot of the same beats. Uh, Bleach has some of the same beats, but yeah, again, uh, that one is best enjoyed in bits and pieces, depending on uh, on what you prefer. Uh, yeah, most most of your shonen anime tropes, uh, My Hero Academia, that that one's pretty good. Uh, yeah, Trigun has some elements in there. If you're looking for more, jeez, I wish I could recommend Berserk, but if you can find the original. Uh, the original animation is uh, even that. Berserk's is too dark, probably, for most people who like. Um, so, stuff. anime that I've put on my list recently through either recommendation or seeing it come up in my Facebook feed and going, oh, this looks fun for me. Oh, right. Inuyasha. It's like Demon Slayer, except it never ends. <laughs> and, it's, and it's an isekai. Um, so, I threw on my wish on my watch list uh, um, High School X, uh, DXD. I threw Food Wars on because that was recommended by you guys. Black Lagoon because that was recommended by friend of the show, Robert Cooper. Black uh, Lagoon is a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. And was there anything else you wanted me to watch, Lily? No? Okay. Uh, I don't know. Okay. So, yeah. High As I watch the shows, I might recommend them. So, High School DXD, Food Wars, and Black Lagoon. Robert, any of those worth talking about? Uh, that's going to come down to you. Okay. Uh, look, I can talk about I have no interest in high school DXD. Both Food Wars and Black Lagoon I'd be willing to talk about. Uh, uh, Black Lagoon, if nothing else, because Revy is... Revy is how you write a badass female character. Okay. Because she's, other... a, because she's a badass first and female secondary. So the other thing, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll segue right into plugs... So I got a hold of my daughter's Netflix account, and after this excursion through Demons there, um, I went on there, and I was like, here's what I think you should watch. There are three anime Godzilla movies that came out over the uh, last... Hmm, interesting um, choice. <laughs> ...on uh, Netflix, and I didn't read that they were TVMA or anything, so they seemed fine. So I told her that uh, she it's, should watch those, those three Godzilla films. It's more that they're not all that good. That doesn't matter. So, so making Lily watch the, those three anime Godzilla films. All right. Uh, with that said, are you curious about any of the animes I have been watching? Oh, do you have an answer that doesn't take twelve years and a lot of thought? Because <laughs> now's the time. Go. No, when no, when you went on just online. just just give your list. Well, one the ones I've been watching are 
Seven Deadly Sins. Um, Solid choice. It, it's an annoying show, but I still watch it. Um, and Hunter x Hunter. Are, there are others I've been seeing, and I might watch them, but those are two I've started. Okay. Um, tomorrow night on Source Material, I'll have Christian back. Uh, we're looking, we're looking at Ed Brubaker and, by extension, uh, the director uh, Ruffin. And so our be our journey begins with Scene of the Crime, the award-winning book by Ed Brubaker, and then myself and Jesse, possibly Robert, we'll see. We'll be discussing the show that he wrote along with Refn and Refn directed on Amazon Prime, Too Old to Die Young, which features the greatest car chase I've Stop. ever seen in cinematic oh no. history. Oh, no. Just that one, not that one. <laughs> I showed that to Lily in 50 <laughs> words or less, actually 10 words or less. When I showed you the Mandy car chase, what was your reaction? I, I screamed at Dad, I am disappointed because <laughs> who... Whose idea was it to put a love song in a car chase? It, car chases are supposed to be filled with action, not love. Good point. <laughs> That's not true. You can totally have a car chase scene full of love. That's no. what I'm saying. No. You can do both. I still wouldn't choose. I still wouldn't choose Barry Manilow to be the soundtrack to it. There's better <laughs> love songs. I watched that scene five times in a row. Anyway, we're gonna talk. Um, we're gonna talk about that, and then Jesse's gonna wander into the woods to live deliberately. Um, speaking of Refn, uh, instead of talking about Drive, because why would we do that? Instead, we're gonna do Only God Forgives as an on trial. So that's myself and Sean Comer. Me and the Podsman will be reviewing the Elimination Chamber. Um, myself and Robert Winfrey will be back on DMU Hollywood to do I Care A Lot, which Rosamund Pike was actually nominated for a Golden Globe. I don't know if you know that, Robert. Uh, didn't. Don't care. Terrific. And then lastly, um, and I think our last show, actually, of the month, uh, myself and Patrick Mullen will be doing the next chapter in the history of heavyweight boxing. We'll be focusing on Lennox Lewis, the last man to unify all the titles. So that's exciting. All the heavyweight titles. Uh, David, what do you got going on with you? you have, hey, you finished, you finished editing yet? Huh? Finished editing yet? Right, finished Just editing? about. All right. Yeah, should, should, be, should be out within the next day or two. So what Mark is referencing is uh, Robert and I did a podcast where we talked about the next generation Star Trek movies. So, you know, if you want to listen to the two of us talk about Star Trek next generation films for an hour and a half. You would like to listen to that. <laughs> Other than uh, that, what have we got coming up? Uh, I think I'm booked in to do the Pacific Rim Netflix original animation series. And uh, I think Andrew and I are doing the right stuff on Disney+. Plus. Yep. I think before... Uh, well, I think the next thing you're involved with is the Pacific Rim anime. But also, um, we're doing Lower Decks, just me and you. Yes. Yeah. And definitely we'll do Lower Decks together. And I'll probably be on for the Demon Slayer movie because I'm sure I'll be going to see that and uh, probably season two whenever that happens. All right. Um, and if there's ever any anime that you want to discuss that Robert has no interest in, let me know, Dave, and we'll figure it out. Uh, all right. Robert Winfrey, take me home, baby doll. Take me home tonight. You can listen to that on Amazon Music at any time. Take me home tonight. My daughter's hitting me in the arm and trying to get me to stop singing. But nobody can stop me from singing. Not ever. Robert. Uh, which overpass were you? Did I find you under again? <laughs> so this is all your fault? <sighs> yeah, sure. I'll take that L. Uh, you can find me most Saturdays in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania. I cover UFC events for that particular website. Had an event last night. Lots of finishes. Some decent fights. Some duds. What are you going to do? It's just kind of how it goes. Hot balls done killed Curtis Blades. Uh, that, that, uh, that depressed me. <laughs> for, for reasons I can't fully articulate just yet. Uh, so you can find me there. You can find me Fridays in the wrestling zone of 411 Mania. I cover WWE SmackDown, and I am just driving the viewership down. Just I'm killing it single-handedly. And I mean that not in the good way, killing it. I am trying to just murder every single solitary person that views that programming. So you can find me doing that. Uh, Wednesdays, I review MLW. 
uh, also for 411 Mania, on the times they choose to post my reviews, I guess. The last one I did... Do you have an answer? Like, like 50 I haven't, or less? Did I you have an answer from Ashish as to why? I haven't asked you. I'm, I kind of meant to... I'll probably ask Jeremy about it tonight, just uh, when I tell him that my other podcast is set. Just, hey, by the way, I did have that, and I, I'm kind of... I a little bit surprised nobody posted it. Of course, it would happen the one time I'm actually positive about a show I watched. It just never goes up. Yeah. All right. Been, I, uh, hang on. And I host the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast uh, where I can talk a lot about MMA. I'll be recording that later this Sunday, actually, and then should be up Monday. Uh, I am the host of Damn You Hollywood here on the Rattle and Broadcasting Network. So Tuesdays, more or less, when we can kind of find movies in time. Both of which seem to be in somewhat short supply at the moment. Uh, there's a non-trivial chance I'll be yelling about the lack of artistic restraint that went into Too Old to Die Young. And what a just... Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't even really have words at the moment for that show. It's so... Uh, it's so I'm frustrating. Sort of a better phrase for how to end a podcast with I don't, I, I don't have the words. So with that said... <laughs> for my daughter Lily, who I thought did a very nice job on her first uh, panelist podcast, where I didn't kick her off the show after five minutes and tell her to go to bed. First, that real was very podcast. specific. <laughs> first real podcast. I thought you did an outstanding job, and we'll have to find another one of these projects that you're enthusiastic about to do again. For uh, D- David Wright and Robert Winfrey, I'm Mark Rattledge. Be well, be safe, and behave. Bye.